Good afternoon, everybody. It is my great pleasure uh, to be here today and present to you some of the work that we have recently done with my research group. And as Kathy mentioned, I'll be discussing specifically some of the research that we have done evaluating different strategies to manage second and subsequent insemination for lactating dairy cows. Uh, we do have some research, of course, for first service, and, and uh, if anybody's interested, I would be happy to discuss, but the interest of time, I'll just focus on second and subsequent services, which is, of course, a very critical component of the reproductive management program of any dairy farm. So anybody who is involved with inseminating cows or running a repro program for their cows is well aware of the challenges associated with trying to inseminate all cows at detected estrus. So we have some issues with the physiology of the cow. So cows are basically not perfect. So we have uh, some biological limitations such as anovulation, issues with uh, delay return to estrus because of delayed luteal regression, in many cases associated with pregnancy losses. So that, that certainly doesn't help. You know, that's the problem on the cow side is the fact that some cows either do not show estrus at all or have delayed estrus after previous insemination. On the other hand, we, we still have problems and we will probably always have issues with the methods that we use to detect cows in heat, whether it's uh, through visual observation, all the way to the latest technologies that we have available today to identify cows in estrus. So none of these methods are perfect. And because of that, there will be some cows that even though they, they show estrus, they are not detected uh, because of failures due to the method. So when, when these two factors are combined, what we basically end up with is a distribution of re-inseminations that looks about like this. And, and this is the pattern of re-inseminations for second and subsequent services at a commercial dairy farm. Uh, we can see here the, the peak from 20 to 30 days. Those are the estrus events at the time interval that we expect cows to express estrus and be re-inseminated. But you can also appreciate here, as for this dairy, uh, there is unfortunately a pretty substantial proportion of cows, in this case, more than 40% of the cows that will go on for quite a while without receiving an insemination. So in this case, in particular, I highlighted 45 days, uh, which is, you know, it's for a specific reason, as, as you will see in a moment. But for this dairy in particular, more than 40% of the cows are not re-inseminated after 45 days. This is certainly problematic. This will reduce the 21-day service rate for this farm and therefore the 21-day pregnancy rate. So this is certainly not good for the overall reproductive performance of a lactating cow herd. So what the dairy industry has done uh, is basically adopt uh, the use of resynchronization of ovulation programs for second and subsequent services to be used in combination with insemination of cows at detected estrus. So this is another example. So this is a dairy in which there is a combination of inseminations at detected estrus, but also the use of resynchronization of ovulation, which explain this uh, uh, peak here uh, in, in terms of a number of inseminations and this uh, 42 plus minus three day interval. And this is basically due to, again, the use of you know, resynchronization of ovulation, the systematic implementation of resynchronization of ovulation programs, in this case in particular at 32 days after the previous insemination. So this is something that the industry has been doing for a long time. And uh, I, I hope that the majority of you that are listening to this webinar, uh, if you were with dairy farms that at least some sort of program like, like the one that I have in, in place here on my slide is being implemented. So this would be certainly an improvement over the uh, uh, 
use of or exclusive use of estrus detection to submit cows for re-insemination. So I'll make the assumption that most dairies already are doing something like this. Uh, this is again something that is very well known that we had had for, for many years. But we're always looking for improvement. We're always looking for ways to improve performance. And at the time of improving the reproductive performance of cows managed for second and subsequent services, uh, there are two critical aspects that lead to success. One of those is, of course, as for any program, is maximizing the fertility of inseminations. But also there is a critical one for second and subsequent services that is minimizing the interval between those inseminations. So any, any ideal program that, that we try to design to manage second and subsequent services uh, will have to take into account these two factors. How well cows become pregnant after we inseminate them, but also very importantly, uh, trying to reduce the interval in between insemination. So we want to re-inseminate cows as soon as possible. And that can be uh, achieved through uh, different uh, ways, you know, uh, starting resynchronization earlier, uh, using different uh, resynchronization uh, formulation programs that have different duration. But one of the uh, areas that we have been exploring with our research in, in recent years is basically trying to use information that can be gathered from the ovaries of the cows at the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis or at the time of the pregnancy test. And based on the information that we gather about the physiological status of the cow with you know, what we can see on her ovaries, we can make decisions as to what treatment to put on certain cows. And this is what I'll be discussing from now on, but, but the concept is very simple. Not just put all open cows on the same treatment, but uh, differentiate cows based on their ovarian status to try to take advantage of some of the different programs that we can use to either reduce the interbreeding interval, maximize the fertility of time inseminations, and in other cases, even to promote more estrus expression and re-inseminate as many cows at detected estrus as possible. So there are two main types of programs that I'll be discussing today, which have been the focus of research in our lab as well as others. The first type of programs is, is one that uh, has as uh, main outcomes or main uh, interests or objectives to reduce the interbreeding interval for a majority of the cows that need re-insemination, but without affecting estrus expression. So the idea is to uh, try to re-inseminate as many cows at detected estrus, but reduce the re-insemination interval for those cows that receive TAM AI. And on the other hand, another objective is to also try to increase the fertility of a subgroup of cows that we can specifically identify at the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis and, and try to increase their fertility through targeting those cows with specific treatments that, that are designed to uh, improve their fertility based on their physiological status. So that's uh, a type of program that I'll, I'll be discussing. And then I'll, I'll in a second part of my webinar, I'll discuss this other type of program that has a little bit of a different goal. And the goal is to try to maximize the insemination of cows that detected estrus through induction of estrus expression after non-pregnancy diagnosis. So rather than putting all cows that we find not pregnant on a time AI protocol, give cows, you know, in particular a certain subgroup of cows, a second chance to be detected in estrus and inseminated before we put them on a time AI program. So before I go on to show you some of the research that we have recently done, I, I wanna make sure they acknowledge some of the support that we received to conduct this research. In particular, the, the New York Farm Viability Institute in New York, uh, which provided uh, a grant for which uh, 
uh, that we have used uh, to conduct uh, the, the first set of experiments that I'll show you. So uh, for the first group of strategies, those ones that are meant to reduce the interbreeding interval and optimize the fertility of, of certain uh, groups of cows, uh, I'll describe two different management strategies for second and subsequent services. The first one is the one that you can appreciate here on this slide is what we call the short resync plus cedar sync program. As I mentioned, this is a management strategy. It's not just a protocol. It's a way to manage cows for, for second and subsequent services. So we combine two different synchronization of ovulation protocols for cows. And as I mentioned earlier, the decision to put cows on the different protocols is based on what they have on their ovaries. What is their ovarian status at the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis? So for, for this program in particular, the idea is to conduct insemination at detected estrus up to the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis without any intervention. So there will be no hormonal intervention, no treatments given to cows up to the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis. In this case, I have the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis at 32 days, which is the timing at which a lot of dairies are conducting non-pregnancy diagnosis today, but also the timing at which we have uh, use for, for our research trials and for which we have the most data. If anybody's interested, I, I could discuss later on what would be the potential impact of having a different timing of non-pregnancy diagnosis. But for all the research that we have done and what I'll show you from now on, it has been done at 32 days. Of course, this is done with transrectal ultrasonography, which not only allows us to conduct non-pregnancy diagnosis at this stage after the previous insemination, but also to identify CLs, so corporal lutea and follicles on the ovaries, which is critical for the uh, program uh, that we have here. So it, it is very, very important. And, and so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time discussing this, but it's very, very important that there is accurate non-pregnancy diagnosis and that the technician conducting non-pregnancy diagnosis is also able to identify CLs and follicles and conduct at least some basic measurements of these structures at the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis. So basically at the time that cows are identified as non-pregnant, they will divide it in two groups. In one group, we have those cows that have a CL present, so they have a corpus, at least one corpus luteum present. And for now on, the definition of a corpus luteum would be a CL that has at least 15 millimeters in diameter or more. If there is CL tissue present, but it's less than 15 millimeters in diameter, the cow would go to the no CL group. Of course, the percentage of cows that we have that, that have a CL of less than 15 millimeters is, is minimal. However, I, I wanted to make that clarification. So for the cow to be in this group, she has to have at least one CL of 15 millimeters or greater. And she also needs to have a follicle of 10 millimeters or greater. This is uh, important. This is how we have always done this in our experiments and how we know that it works. The only reason why I simplify this and only mention the CL is because more than 95 to 97% of the cows that do have a CL of 15 millimeters or greater at this time point will also have a follicle of 10 millimeters or larger. However, if there is any cow, that very small percentage of cows that do not have a follicle of 10 millimeters or greater, those cows should also be assigned to the no CL group. So once that the uh, uh, cow uh, has been exa ex examined and, and we, we have certainty of the presence of the CL and the follicle, then the cow will go on into what we um, call the short breathing protocol. This is a, uh, you know, very simple, it's like the end of the option protocol. So after the prostaglandin treatment, what you will notice is that we do have two prostaglandin treatments 24 hours apart. And there are specific reasons for this, in particular, you know, trying to improve luteal regression, which is critical for this program. 
So two prostaglandins 14 days apart, then GnRH 32 hours after the second prostaglandin or 56 hours after the first one. So, you know, from a practical perspective, again, this is the same that we do for uh, uh, programs like opsin with two prostaglandins or uh, a double opsin with two prostaglandins or a precinct opsin with two prostaglandins. So nothing changes still same timing from the first prostaglandin to the GnRH, and then the same timing until insemination. So the reason why we call this a short protocol is because it's three days from non-pregnancy diagnosis to re-insemination. So we also expect that the majority of the cows will go on uh, to uh, receive this protocol. In our research, about 70 to 75% of the cows go into this route. So we are reducing the interbreeding interval. It's a 35-day interbreeding interval for a pretty significant percentage of the cows. However, we, we also have this type of cows. So we have those ones that do not have a CL or do not have the follicle that we need for them to properly respond to this protocol. And we know that if those cows are put on, on the short racing protocol, they wouldn't do pretty well. So we divert these cows into a, a different protocol, in this case, the cedar seen protocol with two prostaglandin treatments. I'll go on to show the, the protocol in more detail in a moment. But the concept here is that we have this subgroup of cows that they wouldn't do very well in the short racing protocol. We also would expect that they don't do as well in a typical off protocol without progesterone supplementation and a single prostaglandin, and I'll show data for that. So that is why we put them on this protocol. Remember, we're trying to optimize the fertility of these cows. So uh, that's that's the protocol uh, or the program. So a treatment for cows with CLs, a treatment for cows without a CL. So in more detail, the, the program, the, the cedar scene program, or as I will call you, I'll call it later to a progesterone opsin program with two prostaglandin treatments is what we like to use for no CL cows. Here you have the protocol, it's, it's nothing else than an opsin protocol with two prostaglandin treatments 24 hours apart and the inclusion of a progesterone releasing device. In, in this case, I say cedar because it's the only product that is commercially available for uh, dairy farms in the US but any other progesterone releasing device that releases the same amount of progesterone would, would also work. So uh, this protocol uh, for this type of cows would be expected to generate pregnancy spray AI or conception rate in the uh, range of about 35 to 40%, as we have observed in previous research. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, there is a reason why we put cows into this protocol and not into a, a simple opsin protocol with one uh, prostaglandin treatment and no progesterone supplementation. And that is because the fertility of cows without a CL at this time point that go through a straight opsin protocol with, its, with one prostaglandin is not going to be optimal. Of course, it's, it's not very low, but we know that it's not going to be optimal. And here you have some data from, from a research trial that we conducted to compare uh, the opsin protocol with a single prostaglandin and no progesterone supplementation versus the cedar sin protocol with the two prostaglandin, exactly what you see on this slide. And as you can appreciate, there was a substantial numerical difference and a statistically significant difference in favor of the cedar sin group. So it, it basically increased pregnancy spray AI by more than 10 percentage points. And that is the main reason why we suggest that no CL cows receive this protocol. However, there are some dairies that either prefer not to or cannot use uh, a protocol with a progesterone, intravaginal progesterone releasing device. For those dairies, there, there is a way to uh, get around the, the problem of not being able to use this protocol and still optimize or increase the fertility of cows without a CL. So here you have the protocol is what we usually call the pre-G-Opsin protocol. Some uh, other people also refer to this as the GGP protocol. And as you can appreciate as well, here is with two prostaglandin treatments. So uh, the idea here is to, uh, again, avoid the use of the progesterone releasing device. And the way to um, 
uh, get around that is by treating cows with GnRH. So this would be the timing of non-pregnancy diagnosis. So cows receive a GnRH treatment and they start the opsin protocol with two prostaglandin treatments 24 hours apart and no progesterone supplementation seven days after the first GnRH or the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis. In terms of the expectation for pregnancy per AI, uh, based on the research that we have done in commercial dairy farms, I can say that it's going to be very similar to that of the cedar sink protocol. So it's going to be in the range of 35 to 40% pregnancies per AI. So this is a pretty effective protocol. Uh, the benefit is, again, the fact that we uh, can avoid the use of an intravaginal progesterone releasing device. The main drawback of this protocol is the fact that the interval until we insemination is going to be longer. So it's 17 days from beginning to end as compared to 10 days for the Cedarstein protocol. As I mentioned earlier in my presentation, one critical aspect of resynchronization of ovulation programs is the interbreeding interval. So unfortunately, uh, this protocol will extend the interbreeding interval as compared to a CRC protocol. It works really, really well from a fertility perspective. It's just that cows will be inseminated a little bit later. So just uh, to recap uh, here, so we have once again the short racing protocol. And in this case, uh, as we have used it in most of our research combined with a cedar sync protocol. But again, uh, this could be combined with the pre geopsing protocol. So uh, the protocol uh, was developed uh, by our group and, and you know, the protocol worked well initially, but of course we, we needed to do some research to demonstrate that this protocol would, or this program to manage second and subsequent services would have value as compared to uh, uh, what farms do, okay? And of course, it's always hard to say what farms do. I mean, uh, there is a lot of variation, but, but uh, we um, did some research comparing it to what we thought is a very typical way to manage cows for second and subsequent services. So, hey, Julio? Uh, Yes, Leo, okay. this is, um, I just want to, before you kept going, we, we did have one question from the folks at the UBC Dairy Center. Yeah. Um, so they, they're asking for the treatment of cows with a CL, what's the difference in pregnancy um, AI if you only give one PG shot? That's a really great question. So they're, they're asking about this. So what happens if you give a single prostaglandin? And unfortunately, I don't have the answer. <laughs> and I don't have the answer because we have never done that. And the reason is because we we think, we speculate that uh, that second prostaglandin is, is likely necessary because, um, and I don't want to get too much into uh, complicated physiology here, but we have done a lot of physiological uh, work behind this, you know, evaluated the ovarian function of a lot of cows before we develop this program. And what, what could happen is that because we are not giving GnRH a week before uh, the timing of non-pregnancy diagnosis, as we, you will see that we do with another program. So there may be cows that ovulate really close to the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis, and therefore they will have a, a relatively young CL present on day 32. And then it may be problematic to regress those young CLs with a single prostaglandin. So that's why we always went with the two prostaglandins. We do know that there are some cows that ovulate really close to the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis. So uh, we, we haven't had the chance to compare one versus two, so I don't have data, but I would say that it's probably necessary. So I don't know, I, I hope this answers the question. Uh, if not, please uh, let us know in the chat box and I'll get back to it. But it's a really good question and something that we still need to, uh, to explore. So uh, going back again to the research that we done, so we wanted to compare the, the short racing program and we did that, uh, you know, comparing it to a typical day 32 racing protocol. So starting the opsin protocol with a single prostaglandin treatment 32 days after previous insemination. Again, this is what we, we thought it was typical that many dairy farms use and what we use as our control group. Uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here, but just you know, for you to know what are the results uh, for this, what were the results for this experiment as far as 
pregnancies per AI, and here we differentiate cows in, in the different groups and cows overall. One thing that I'll mention, so these are CL cows. There was no significant difference between cows that had a CL at the beginning of the OPSIM protocol or CL cows in the show receive program. So there was no difference there. And uh, one thing that I want to note that I'll come back to later is that the, the fertility of re-inseminations with the show recent protocol is not going to be ideal uh, for, for reasons that I'll discuss later, but, but that's important to keep in mind. And then as, as I showed you before too, and this is actually the data uh, that I showed you before for no CL cows, uh, the cedar seed protocol did improve the fertility of these no CL cows. And then overall pregnancy spray AI when putting all together uh, CL cows and no CL cows was not different. But uh, th this is of course interesting. This is uh, important to know what is the expected pregnancy per AI. But of course the most critical data is uh, the uh, timing of pregnancy or the pregnancy rate. And this is what we have in here is basically, uh, these are the survival curves for time to pregnancy during 210 days after the first service. So we compare cows in the two management strategies, short recent in green and day 32 recent in blue for uh, about uh, uh, seven months after the first insemination, trying to see what is the impact over almost the entire lactation after the first service. And uh, what we observed was that indeed the, the short recent program uh, increased the pregnancy rate in a way, it reduced time to pregnancy uh, by 11 days on average. So you can see that the green line goes down faster. So for those of you that are familiar with survival curves, so you, you notice that uh, this program in green is getting cows pregnant faster. So, and, you know, the, the hazard ratio for time to pregnancy was significant. So that's an indication uh, that there were um, uh, differences between the groups. Again, an 11 day difference on average. And also very important that it was almost a seven percentage point difference in percentage of uh, pregnant cows at the end of the observation period. So cows not only became pregnant faster with the short recent strategy, but also more cows were pregnant at the end of lactation or the end of their risk period for, for this experiment. So those were the two benefits for this um, uh, for this program. So in conclusion, I mean, what, what we can say is that at least compared to a typical program with day 32 racing to resynchronize cows for uh, second and subsequent services, the management strategy, including short racing, consider sync would, uh, you know, reduce time to pregnancy and lead to a greater percentage of pregnant cows at the end of lactation. So that's pretty good. That's pretty exciting and means that this program may be able to improve the uh, fertility, uh, not the fertility, but the overall reproductive performance of dairy herds. I see uh, some activity in the chat box. Kathy, I mean, I don't know if there, if there are questions probably that they should. Yes, there is. So um, John Muncy asked, was there any difference between premiparous and multiparous cows? Uh, that's a good question, and, and uh, no. So th there were no differences uh, between uh, primipers and multipers cows. So that's also important in a way, uh, the fact that it, it seemed to work for both groups of cows. So that, that's a great question. Thanks. Any other question, Kathy? Uh, no, nope, that's it for now. Okay, very good. So anyway, um, so once again, so here we have the program. Uh, but then uh, the one thing that, you know, anybody who uses synchronization or understands synchronization uh, probably is wondering about is, so why we don't give cows G and RH a week before the timing of non-pregnancy diagnosis, right? So, I mean, if, if you look at the opsin protocol or opsin like protocols, we always start with a G and RH treatment. Uh, to try to induce ovulation, have better control of the follicular weight dynamics, uh, actually increase the percentage of cows that will have a CL at the time of the prostaglandin. But you know, there, there is a very particular reason why we, we don't do that in the short racing protocol. And that is because we do not want to interfere with estrus expression before non-pregnancy diagnosis. The premise with this program is to take advantage 
of good estrus detection efficiency and good pregnancy spray eye for estrus breeding. And that's something that we are seeing more and more. So we are seeing more and more farms that are doing a really great job detecting cows in estrus and that they also have really good fertility with those estrus breedings. So what we want to, so we still want to reduce the interbreeding interval through time AI. We want to optimize the fertility of certain groups of cows, but we do not want to interfere with estrus expression. We want to re-inseminate as many cows as detected estrus as possible. And that is the reason why we don't give GnRH in the short grazing program. However, we, we still have the question, I mean, if you were to give GnRH, what would be the consequences? So what would be the true, uh, you know, reduction in estrus expression when you give GnRH? And also, what would be the consequences on pregnancy per AI for the cows that receive time AI? You know, one would expect that by giving GnRH, cows will be better synchronized and therefore have improved pregnancy per AI. So that has been the, the subject of some of the research that we have done. Uh, but before that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you here conceptually what I'm talking about. And it's basically giving this GRA treatment here at 25 plus minus three days after uh, the previous insemination or seven days after uh, before non-pregnancy diagnosis. So this is what I'm talking about. It's either giving or not giving this GnRH treatment and seeing what are the consequences. And our hypothesis was that this would affect the percentage of cows inseminated that detected estrus, but also the fertility of cows that received time AI, in particular, the subgroup of cows with CLs. Is there a question, Kathy? Actually, I should probably try nope. to- the No, there box. isn't, Julio, we're all set. I can see the chat box myself. Okay, I just realized You answered that. what we had. With okay. All right. Very good. Excellent. So um, basically, that that was the uh, subject of uh, of uh, a research experiment that we did, and in fact, this is the uh, the trial that was uh, funded through our grant from the New York Farm Viability. So uh, basically, we, we had a very simple question. So what what are the consequences of giving or not giving this GnRH. So the, the study was very simple. So we either gave or did not give GnRH on day 25. After day 25, management was exactly the same. Uh, we were of course interested on percentage of cows detected in estrus and, and PAI, but also very importantly, and this is what I want you to uh, keep in the back of your mind. I mean, so what, what was the effect again on time to pregnancy on overall reproductive performance? So anyway, uh, to the first question, what, what was the impact on percentage of cows inseminated at detected estrus before non-pregnancy diagnosis? So it was 50% when giving GnRH and 60% when not giving GnRH. There was a statistically significant difference. However, from, you know, from a practical perspective, I mean, it's not as large of a difference as, as we expected, and uh, you will be able to see the consequences later. But the, the first message here is, yes, there will be a difference. We will inseminate more cows at detected estrus with the short grazing program. However, we can still inseminate quite a few cows, about half of the cows at detected estrus, even if we give GnRH. So the, the suppression and uh, the estrus suppression is not as dramatic when giving GnRH. And uh, it was about 10%, and this was consistent with uh, another uh, previous experiment. So another important aspect that I want to highlight here is the fact that uh, pregnancy per AI or conception rate of this estrus breeding is pretty good. And I want to highlight this because this is very critical for the success of the short racing program. And this is what I was alluding to before, right? So we have these farms that are doing a pretty good job detecting cows in estrus before non-pregnancy diagnosis and they breed these cows and they get really, really good fertility, right? So the idea is to take advantage of this as much as possible with a program such as short reason. But then uh, we, we looked at the pregnancies per AI for cows that receive time AI. And first, another important aspect of this, another uh, consequence of giving the GnRH on day 25 is going to be having more cows that have a CL present at the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis. So this is what you can see here. Again, it's also not a dramatic difference, but uh, it was uh, significant in our study. So about 84% of the cows 
did have a CL at the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis, and therefore they would go through the short part of the program and be re-inseminated three days later. Uh, as you will see here too, they will have pretty decent fertility, whereas it was 77% for uh, the short wheezing program. So uh, for uh, cows that did have a CL at non-pregnancy diagnosis, so here you can appreciate the difference in fertility. And you know, as you would expect, I mean, we, you don't have to be a rocket scientist again, I mean, to uh, hypothesize this, that cows that receive GnRH will have better fertility. And in this, this is what we observe. This is the second study where we observe the same. So there is this difference in favor of the cows that get GnRH. So pregnancy spray I is going to be anywhere from eight to 10 percentage points greater for the cows that receive GnRH. Hold on, I mean, don't think that this is a disaster for short reason. It doesn't mean that the program is a failure, right? Uh, what, you know, pregnancy spur AI or conception rate is just one piece of the puzzle, right? Just one component of the program. And it's certainly critical as I'll discuss later, uh, but um, uh, it is still, you know, the, the pregnancy spur that we get here is reasonable. Then for no CL cows, uh, there was no significant difference. What I would like to point out here is the really nice fertility that we get. Again, this is the cedar seed program with two prostaglandins. And then when putting all the uh, re-inseminations with time AI together, there's of course uh, graded PAI for uh, this uh, day 25 racing program, the one that included GnRH more than anything because the majority of the cows had a CL and they had greater fertility than cows in the no CL group. So again, so the message here is uh, there will be more cows that will have a CL when they get GnRH. Those cows that have a CL will have better fertility than uh, the cows that don't get GnRH. And then for the no CL cows, fertility is expected to, to be the same. So overall, the PAI, the pregnancy PAI for the groups that receive GnRH will be better. So, but again, as, as I showed before, and, and, and you know, very critical for this experiment, at, at the end of the day, what matters the most uh, is time to pregnancy, right? Is you know, the, the pregnancy rate during lactation. So here you have once again survival curves for time to pregnancy for 210 days after the first insemination. And what uh, you, you sh you're looking at here is two curves that are not different. So basically they overlap. So there was no statistically significant difference and no significant, no difference of practical value in time to pregnancy between the two programs. Also very importantly, as I mentioned before, the percentage of pregnant cows at the end of the at risk period in this case was not significantly different and you know, it barely differs numerically. So in conclusion, I mean, for uh, these experiments of two commercial farms of which we run, these two management strategies for the entire lactation uh, for quite a few cows. So in spite of differences in percentage of cows inseminated at detected estrus, differences in pregnancy per AI for cows that have CL um, for, for the two programs, time to pregnancy or the pregnancy rate was the same and there was no difference in the percentage of pregnant cows at the end of lactation. So the take home message is these two programs work well and they work similarly uh, if applied under similar conditions than those of our experiment. So uh, to conclude with this part, so I'll, I'll just make a few comments about the two programs that I presented, right? So the short racing program plus cedar sync or like they have it in here for just an op sync. So I, I think that this is a program that can be implemented successfully in dairy farms. So among the benefits of the program is once again, the fact that we are not interfering with estrus expression and we can take advantage of cows that are detected in estrus before non-pregnancy diagnosis and have good fertility. So we are betting on this. We, we are uh, putting our money here and, and expecting that we're going to generate a lot of pregnancies through detection of estrus. So we are also reducing the interbreeding interval for a pretty substantial proportion of cows, so about 70 to 75% of the cows, again, will have a CL and will go this route 
a mirror inseminated at 35 days. And we are also increasing the fertility of no-CL cows, which is a group of cows that we know that they will have reduced fertility if they go through a regular offspring protocol. So, you know, these are all the benefits of the program. However, as I mentioned, the PAI or fertility of these CL cows is not going to be the highest possible. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And this may be a little bit of an issue for some dairies. I mean, if their mindset is that it's all about getting the highest conception rate, it may be hard to deal with the fact that it's not going to be the very best with this program. But once again, I remind you that what matters the most is you know, time to pregnancy, right? And of course, uh, economics and so on. The other thing that I have to mention here is the fact that we're not giving GnRH on day 25 means that we're not giving GnRH to pregnant cows, uh, which basically means that uh, dairies will, will not be giving these GnRH treatments to cows that do not need the treatment. Uh, this may be relevant for, for the labor and a cost perspective, as well as not interfering with, with cows, I mean, not intervening, right? So, it's another aspect that is a problem for the program, including GNRH, as I'll mention in a moment. So, uh, so uh, just to conclude, so this is, you know, uh, what I, I, I usually say is that, you know, this is a strategy that is preferred for farms that are successful with estrus breeding. So farms that struggle with estrus detection probably should not consider this type of strategy as they will not benefit as much. In that case, I mean, for farms that do struggle with estrus detection and are not as good at detecting cows in estrus before non-pregnancy diagnosis, I think that giving the GnRH on day 25 would, would be a good idea. So in this case, we, we are not banking so much on estrus breedings, but rather on time AI services. So we want to optimize the fertility of time AI services and the percentage of cows that get time AI. So by giving this GnRH, we're gonna have more cows that get time AI, more cows are going to have a CL, and we know that the fertility of those cows with a CL is really, really good. So this is a pretty good strategy. So we are still reducing the interbreeding interval in a very substantial proportion of the cows. We are improving the fertility of the subgroup of cows without a CL. So the drawback of this one is going to be from a practical perspective. Again, the fact that we are giving GnRH on day 25, we do not know the pregnancy status of cows, so all pregnant cows will receive GnRH treatment. They don't need that treatment. They don't benefit most likely from that treatment. So that's going to be extra labor and extra cow manipulation that uh, at least larger dairies or dairies that do not have as much labor available are trying to avoid. Okay, so anyway, so that's uh, uh, again the, the other strategy and, and one that works really, really well. You know, I think that the, that the decision to go with one versus the other, and both are really effective, is once again how good the farm is at detecting cows in estrus. So, uh, this is the end of this part. I don't know uh, if the audience has any questions, I would be very happy to answer them. If not, I'll move on to, to the second part. Okay, uh, you don't see anything coming, so I'll keep going. Yep. So I'll, I'll discuss uh, the second type of strategy, the ones that are meant to maximize insemination of cows at detected estrus through induction of estrus expression after non-pregnancy diagnosis. Once again, we are using, and for the most part, uh, or for most of these programs, uh, I'll discuss ovarian data. So the concept here is pretty simple. As I showed you earlier, what a lot of dairies are doing is take advantage of the spontaneous estrus expression, we inseminating cows in estrus, but immediately after non-pregnancy diagnosis, all cows go through time AI. The idea with this type of strategies is instead of putting all open cows into a time AI protocol, is giving them a second chance to be inseminated at detected estrus and try to promote estrus expression, try to have more cows show estrus. So the, the concept is, is here. So we will have the, uh, the typical uh, you know, group of cows that show a spontaneous estrus after the previous insemination. But then through the use of prostaglandins, we're gonna try to generate like, like what I call like a second wave of estrus expression. 
And only after we give cows the second chance to be inseminated or detected estrus, we put them on a time AI protocol to make sure that they are uh, not going for too long without being re-inseminated. And as I have it in here, I think that, I mean, from the get-go, I mean, it's, it's an important thing to keep in mind. I mean, this type of strategy is, is probably a good idea for farms that have really good estrus detection, either through traditional methods or farms that have today or will have in the future automated estrus detection systems. This is probably a really good way uh, to take advantage of these technologies. So I'll, I'll go on to show you uh, quickly the, the type of strategies that are available that I, I just put together based on research that has been done in this field by, by other groups as well as us. And, and then I'll go on to show you some of the research that we have done to say that these type of strategies are, are reasonable, that they work, I mean, that they can be used successfully on dairy farms. So here you have the, the first one and the simplest one. This is in fact one that does not use information about the ovarian status of cows. So after the previous insemination, cows are inseminated at detected estrus. And at the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis, all cows, regardless of whether or not they have a seal on their ovaries, they receive a prostaglandin treatment again, with the idea of promoting estrus expression, inseminating a few more cows, or actually as many cows as possible, at detected estrus, and only after this second period of estrus detection, cows go on into the synchronization of ovulation protocol. You can see here that I don't have a specific protocol. I would say any protocol that ensures uh, you know, insemination and the, the greatest fertility of those inseminations to the TAM AI. Uh, here, I mean, this could be an OPSIN protocol, or if, you know, it's not a problem to check ovaries of cows again at this time point, maybe CL cows get OPSIN, no CL cows get a, a cedar sync protocol or a protocol with pre synchronization with GNRH. That's something that we can discuss uh, if. Um, uh, if the audience is interested. But, you know, I just keep it generic just to say what matters is that a cow goes straight into a time AI protocol after she had this second opportunity to inseminate a detected estrus. And very quickly, a comment about this. So you can see that I have here a period of 32 or 39 days after the previous insemination to conduct non-pregnancy diagnosis and give the prostaglandin treatment. So basically, um, uh, the way that I think about this is Farms that have relatively lower estrus detection efficiency, I, I don't want to overextend this period of time. I'd rather stay in the short end, so I will probably do it at 32 days. I will probably do 39 days or something in the neighborhood of 39 days only for farms that have really, really good estrus detection efficiency, and therefore they're going to re-inseminate a lot of cows that detected estrus, and they are less dependent on what we do after non-pregnancy diagnosis. And uh, I, I give this example, or I, you know, I give this option probably thinking of uh, not a lot of dairies in, in our conditions here in the Northeast and, and the Midwest where cows are in concrete flooring and they, they, they struggle with more to express estrus. But I do this rather thinking about um, dairies in dry lot systems or any dairy in which estrus expression and estrus detection is really, really good. Again, I don't want to say that there are no free salt dairies that can do that, but on average, uh, estrus expression is probably not the best uh, on free stall dairies. So anyway, so that's a program. Again, it's pretty simple. Uh, the issue, I mean, from, from an efficiency perspective with this program is the fact that we know that not all cows have a CL present. At non-pregnancy diagnosis, I already showed you some data for that, and we have lots of data supporting that idea. So uh, giving prostaglandin to some of these cows is not going to be the best, right? I mean, it is pretty much futile, right, to give prostaglandin to cows without a CL. So the alternative to that, and to make this program more uh, efficient in a way, is to once again differentiate cows based on the presence of a CL at the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis. So only cows that have a CL present receive prostaglandin, they go through the period of estrus detection, and then they go through the time program if not detected in estrus. 
Whereas for cows without a CL, we put them straight into a synchronization of ovulation protocol. You can see that here not being too prescriptive. I mean, it could be a seeders in program, as we know, or it could even be uh, the program, uh, with the pre-G opsin program, which starts with uh, GNRH and, and the opsin protocol follows seven days later. So again, uh, I show you at the beginning of the presentation, we have options for these no CL cows and what are the benefits and the drawbacks of each type of program. And I think that either one works, it's just a matter of preference at the farm. And I'll show you some data now to, to support what I'm saying. But anyway, so again, the, the idea, the general concept here is to be a little more efficient and give only prostaglandin and expect that cows show estrus, you know, because they, they did have a CL present at the time of non-pregnancy diagnosis. So we have done some research in, in this area, looking at these type of programs. I don't want to spend a lot of time discussing the experimental design. So this program that you have in here is exactly uh, this program that I show you second. So seal cows, get prostaglandin, and then seven days later, they, they go through the opsin protocol, if not detected in estrus, whereas the no seal cows receive the pre-G opsin protocol. So we had this program, which again, the idea was to maximize insemination of cows at detected estrus and compare that with a program that is more aggressive from the perspective of putting cows straight into a time air program. We also treated cows differently here based on the presence or absence of a CL. And this was based on all the research that we have showing that this may even be a good idea for these type of programs that favor time AI. So once again, I mean, the percentage of cows that we have going this way is, is usually more than the cows going this way, but we still want to optimize the fertility of no seal cows. But anyway, so um, again, the, the basic idea was to compare a program that is meant to maximize insemination of cows that detected estrus for second and subsequent services versus a program that favors time AI instead of uh, when inseminations are detected estrus. So here is some of the most critical data for, for this experiment. So no difference in the percentage of cows re-inseminated at detected estrus before what we call the first treatment intervention, which is right here on day 32. So either the GNRH of the day 32 recent program or non-pregnancy diagnosis and, and the separation of cows based on CLs here for the other group. So that's what I call the first treatment intervention is day 32 after AI. And because we didn't do anything different, right? So there was no difference in the percentage of cows re inseminated at detected estrus. It was uh, similar for both programs. So, what we expected it was to find a difference in percentage of cows re inseminated at detected estrus after our interventions. And indeed, that was the case. So, overall, so putting all open cows together, so 36% of the open cows were re inseminated at detected estrus for the program that favored inseminations at detected estrus versus 11% for the other group. You probably wonder why this is so low. You, you have to remember that not all cows had a CL and therefore got a prostaglandin. So in this experiment, about 65% of the cows, a little less than 65, had a CL present. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. So 60 to 65% of the cows did have a CL here. And out of those 60% of the cows that had a CL, uh, about uh, 50, a little bit, uh, so 40 to 50%, if I don't recall wrong, I think that is um, uh, about 50% of the cows were re-inseminated and detected estrus. So we still have cows that go this route. And, and because of that, the overall percentage of cows re-inseminated and detected estrus was 36% and no more than that. That also is a good point, you know, unfortunately, we do not get 70, 80, or 90% of the cows with inseminated at detected estrus after non-pregnancy diagnosis, even when we give prostaglandins to these cows that only have a CL, that you, know, you would expect that they show estrus, and we still struggle with that. And um, you, know, you can, of course, say that estrus detection may be the problem, but estrus detection this, during this experiment was, was pretty good. Uh, you know, it was done very consistently by experienced personnel. I think that we still struggle with cows that unfortunately do not respond to prostaglandin and do not express estrus. But anyway, overall, as you can see here, 
more cows were inseminated and detected estrus, which was one of the goals of this research. I'm not going to spend much time here. So these are all the results for pregnancy per AI. All that I want to mention is the fact that pregnancy per AI was pretty much the same for all the inseminations. Inseminations are detected estrus, time AI services, and so on. So pregnancy per AI were similar, and they cannot be, uh, so we cannot attribute any potential differences to pregnancy per AI. If there were any differences were due to the different re-insemination dynamics that we generate with the different programs. So once again, what matters most is this, so it's time to pregnancy. So we have here the survival curves for the two programs and we have no difference. So there was no significant difference for the uh, hazard ratio or the pregnancy rate uh, during, again, 210 days after the first insemination. So um, I'm sure that a lot of you are probably thinking this poor guy, Julio, does all this research to uh, realize that there is no difference. But in fact, you know, from our perspective, this is good. And, you know, we, we consider that this is good. I mean, from the perspective that the program works as well as typical programs used by dairy farms, right? So we can say that this type of program, the one that we designed to insemin uh, we inseminate more cows at detected estrus, can be at least as successful as a program that prioritizes time AIs and, and all cows go through time AI protocol immediately after non-pregnancy diagnosis. So if there are farms that are interested on re-inseminating more cows that detected estrus, either because they do really well with estrus breedings uh, or because they have an automated estrus detection system and they want to make the best out of that system, then at least we have data supporting the use of these type of programs that promote, promote more insemination of cows that detected estrus. And this is one example uh, of one study, but we have also done others. So just, you know, I'm not going to describe what we have done, but we have at least two different experiments conducted at two different commercial dairy farms with quite a few cows that have shown similar results. And that is, again, that these programs designed to maximize insemination of cows that detected estrus, you know, they, they, they are good to achieve that goal. But repro performance is not going to be any better or any worse than an average program using offsync or day 32 leasing to, to manage cows. So to conclude, I'm just uh, thinking about uh, the uh, requirements for these programs to work well on farms. So based on what we have observed in our studies, what we have learned from our trials, and what I have seen at some commercial farms that use these type of programs. So if we're gonna go with the strategy in which cows are separated based on the presence or absence of a CL. So of course we, we need to have the majority of cows with the CL present. So according to our research, having at least 65% of the cows, it, it's ideal. So of course we would like to have more. Uh, but, you know, most dairies are going to be in the range of 65 to 75 percent of the cows with a CL present that can get prostaglandin and therefore, you know, be promoted to show estrus. Absolutely critical for the success of this program and even what makes it worth, I mean, even considering this type of strategy is the percentage of cows that are detected in estrus after the intervention, right? I mean, so we, we need to try to inseminate as many cows as possible that detected estrus after the prostaglandin treatment. So it seems that the, the, the minimum necessary for these programs to be the same as a typical uh, program uh, with day 32 resync is about 40%. Of course, it would be fantastic to have, as I said, more. I mean, 60, 70% of the cows were inseminated uh, detected estrus after the prostaglandin. Unfortunately, in the two studies that we have done, we have not seen more than 50%. Under our conditions, you know, it is possible that some dairies can achieve more than that. And, and I think that that would be really good. Uh, of course, I don't have it in here, but the pregnancy per AI of those insemination is also critical. So keep that in mind. I mean, we, we want to re-inseminate these cows in estrus, but we want to make sure that 
Pregnancy Prey is pretty good. And last but not least, uh, it's absolutely critical to systematically enroll cows that have not been re-inseminated and detect the estrus in a time AI protocol so that those cows are re-inseminated as soon as possible. We have already given these cows two chances to be re-inseminated and detect the estrus. It's probably not wise to keep trying and trying, like checking them again two weeks later and treat, try to give them prostaglandin again uh, is probably not the best. Or at least I have to say that in all our research trials in which we have shown that these programs work, work I mean, we have done it putting cows on the time AI protocol. So uh, I cannot venture into saying that these programs would work as well if there's no time AI for cows that are not re-inseminated and detected estrus. So uh, we made it to the end. Thanks a lot for, for your attention. I really appreciate uh, uh, your participation. And uh, I want to make sure that I acknowledge everybody and, and all the institutions that make my research possible. Of course, uh, my team, both graduate as well as undergraduate students and technicians, they are the ones doing the real work. And then uh, the funding agencies, USDA, New York Farm Viability, companies that support our research through collaborations or providing support, and of course the commercial farms that allows us to, to do our research on, on their farms and with their cows.